Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, so uh, you will start with the guest, fifth lecture of our gastrointestinal physiology. Uh, I have already talked to you about the peristaltic rush, and we have discussed the migrating motor complex. Okay, so we were talking about the uh, different movements in the colon. First movement was the mixing movement, and that is uh, basically caused by the hostrations, all right. And the second type of movement is propulsive movement, which is also called as mass movement. I already taught you in our last uh, lecture that um, mixing movement, the main significance of mixing movement is that all of the fecal matter is getting exposed through the mucosa of the large intestine. Okay, And there are certain two, uh, there are two types of muscle present in the large intestine. The first one is the longitudinal muscle. Uh, or longitudinal layer of smooth muscle and the second one is the circular muscle layer okay and these circular muscles and the longitudinal muscles they basically cause the bulging out of colon which is called as hostrations okay so the function of mixing movement is that the fecus is being rolled over gradually being exposed to the mucosal surface of the large intestine also another important function of mixing movement is that the water and electrolytes are getting gradually reabsorbed okay so these are the three parts of colon the first one is the ascending colon okay the second one is transverse colon which is horizontal the third one is descending colon okay so this is the ascending colon the transverse colon and the descending colon okay okay so uh, this part is this part is also called as sigmoid colon all right this sigmoid colon it connects the colon with the rectum okay and over here when small intestine is being connected to the large intestine this part is called as cecum so remember these two terms okay so second type of movement is mass movement all right and this occurs only one to three times a day and in many people this is uh, this movement occurs when the first meal is being taken okay what is this modified type of peristalsis what happens is that a certain constrictive ring appears in response to the distension of large intestine and uh, 20 or more centimeter of colon distal to the constrictive ring it becomes loose and hostrations they also become loose and they contract as a single unit and this propel the feces in the segment further down the colon okay so basically this mass movement helps in the movement of fecal matter from the large intestine towards the sigmoid colon okay and these uh, this basically mass movement is a series of movement which persists for 10 to 30 minutes okay so what initiates the mass movement there are two types of reflexes which initiate this movements first one is gastrocolic reflex and second one is duodenocolic reflex and we have already discussed this in the extrinsic autonomic nervous system okay so now we are going to study about the defecation reflex please guys remember that this uh, question appears multiple times in your exam uh, point of view okay in your uhs pass papers defecation reflex uh, seq normally comes with a three marks question and you have to explain the weak intrinsic defecation reflex as well as the parasympathetic defecation reflex in that question okay so now we are going to discuss it so what is defecation reflex this is basically uh, initiated when a mass movement forces the fecal matter into the rectum so how first we will study how the weak intrinsic defecation reflex occur feces enters the rectum from the sigmoid colon then the distension of rectal wall occurs when the rectal wall is being distended certain signals from the mind direct plexus they spread through the efferent through the efferent nerves okay towards the 
towards the descending colon okay a peristaltic wave is initiated in the descending colon in the sigmoid colon and the rectum and this forces the feces down towards the anus okay but for the feces to be excreted out two things need to happen firstly the internal sphincter should be inhibited or relaxed secondly the external sphincter should also be relaxed by will remember that external sphincter can also be can only be relaxed under the action of your will okay and when this happens defecation occurs okay this uh, this was the weak intrinsic defecation reflex we have just discussed there is another type of strong defecation reflex which is called as parasympathetic defecation reflex okay and this is more effective than the weak reflex what happens is that the feces enters into the rectum the effluent fibers are stimulated and they pass from the uh, colon or from the sorry from the rectum towards the sacral segment of the spinal cord okay from there efferent signals pass through the pelvic nerve and they go towards the sigmoid colon the descending colon rectum and the anus again the internal uh, sphincter should be relaxed okay and this causes the weak intrinsic reflex into the powerful reflex okay uh, the sig uh, when the signals pass from the pass to the sacral segment of the spinal cord and they come back through the pelvic nerve this is basically causing the signals to become more powerful then what happens the person takes a deep breath there is closure of glottis there is contraction of abdominal wall muscles and the pelvic floor relaxes and it is pulled outward on the anal ring to expel the feces if the internal if the external anal sphincter is relaxed by will then defecation will occur again i am going to uh, repeat that if the question uh, comes in your uhs exam or in your prof exam that you have to explain the defecation reflex then you have to mention the weak intrinsic defecation reflex as well as the parasympathetic defecation reflex okay so this is the pathway which i have just told you so what are the functions of colon number 1 it stores the compact it stores and compact the feces it also absorbs the water it absorbs sodium and chloride in the ascending limb there are certain secretion of our carbonates occur which occur in the colon okay uh, apart from that bacterial flora synthesize vitamins like vitamin k it is being uh, synthesized in the colon vitamin b12 will, is also being synthesized here and riboflavin okay and there are certain gases which are being produced here like carbon dioxide methane and hydrogen okay so this was the end of your uh, chapter now we are going to move towards another chapter and you are just going to cover the disorders of git in this chapter uh, rest we are going to leave because that is not in your syllabus okay the first disorder we are going to discuss is diarrhea it is basically the frequent passage of unformed or liquid stool it results from the rapid movement of fecal matter through the large intestine okay uh, fecal matter is not being moved in the normal pace okay it is getting uh, it rushed out from the large intestine severe diarrhea with or without vomiting it results in dehydration hypovolemia it may result into circulatory shock or electrolyte disturbance okay and what is the management of diarrhea uh, we give certain antibiotics and in fluids and it could be iv fluids okay so what is vomiting vomiting is the mean by which upper git gets rid of its content when any part becomes irritated or overly distended okay so uh, what happens is like if there is certain irritation of the mucosa of upper git uh it could be due to some irritant or it could be due to some drug then it will cause the contents to be moved to be removed from the uh, stomach okay okay vomiting can also be stimulated by certain chemoreceptor trigger zones we know that we have uh, chemoreceptors in our brain uh, bilaterally present on the floor of fourth ventricle okay uh, and these uh, this 
uh, trigger zone can be stimulated by certain drugs. It could be opo opioids, it could be certain chemotherapy for cancer treatment, or it could be certain hormones. And in hormones, always remember that it, uh, the most important hormone which causes the vomiting is HCG, human chorionic gonadotrophin, uh, which is uh, increased in the first trimester of pregnancy. Okay. Apart from that, motion and vertigo can also cause vomiting. Certain pe some people have motion sickness and they feel uh, like vomiting whenever they are moving through some hilly area. Okay, so it can also cause vomiting. So, uh, what are the afferent nerves which carry the signals? Uh, they are vagus nerve and sympathetic nerves. The main center for the vomit, this is nucleus of tractor solitarius present in the medulla oblongata. And the efferent nerves which carry the signal back, they are 5th nerve, 7th, 9th and 12th nerve. And they carry the signals to upper GIT and the signals go towards the diaphragm and the abdominal muscle which gets contracted. Okay, so what is the mechanism of vomiting? Basically, uh, we if we recall, peristaltic movement occurs in the digestion. But in case of vomiting, opposite happens, that is anti-peristaltic movements, okay, of upper part of the small intestine uh, to duodenum or it can reach to stomach, okay. Okay, so what is the mechanism? Person takes a deep breath, slight raising of the heart bone occurs, larynx is also getting raised, the upper sphincter, esophageal sphincter then relaxed, which causes the uh, content to be moved out from the stomach towards your oral cavity. Also, glottis is getting closed and soft palate gets lifted so that the posterior nares are closed. Okay, so uh, we have covered peristaltic rush, we have also covered the functions of colon and what are the different types of movement which are uh, occurring in the colon that was the mixing movement and the mass movement which is also called as a propulsive movement okay we have also discussed uh, how the defecation reflex occurs and we have covered the weak uh, defecation reflex and the strong def defecation reflex which is also called as peristaltic reflex okay after that we have covered the disorders of the uh, GIT which are diarrhea vomiting Okay, you have to also go through the constipation which is present in your guidance. That is assignment for you guys. And in uh, after constipation, there was a small paragraph uh, which uh, uh, the heading is mega colon. Okay, you have to cover that as well. And that is the assignment for today's lecture. Okay, so now we are going to, uh, going to continue with the uh, last topic of our GIT that is liver okay so what are the functions of liver first one is filtration and storage of blood second is uh, it also causes the metabolism of carbohydrates proteins fats certain hormones and foreign chemicals we will discuss in detail how this metabol metabolism occurs. Also, the formation of bile. Okay, we will study uh, what is bile and where it is stored. Okay, then it also, uh, the, another important function is storage of certain vitamins and iron and formation of coagulation factors. So, uh, liver is basically the largest organ in our body and it is the functional unit of our body and the functional unit of liver is liver lobule, okay? And the human liver contains 50,000 to 1 lakh lobules. Okay, so in this diagram, you can appreciate that this is the stomach and over here, we have our pyloric sphincter then these this is the small intestine okay so uh, whatever nutrients are being absorbed from the stomach and small intestine they are being carried by hepatic portal system or hepatic portal vein and they carry these nutrients towards the liver okay so liver is receiving blood from two sources remember first one is 
hepatic portal vein which is carrying the nutrients from stomach and small intestine and the second one is hepatic artery because liver needs oxygen as well so hepatic artery is playing its role in getting that oxygen from heart to the liver and the deoxygenated blood leaves the liver through this hepatic vein so the first one was hepatic portal vein which was carrying the nutrients from stomach and small intestine towards the liver the second source of blood was hepatic artery which was carrying the oxygen because liver needs oxygen as well so hepatic artery was carrying that oxygen and the deoxygenated blood leaves the liver through this hepatic vein which uh, later on enters into the inferior vena cava okay so this is a transfer section of the liver okay so uh, you can appreciate that in the center is the central vein then we have sinusoids what are sinusoids they are basically low pressure vessels which are present at the terminal portion of your portal vein and the hepatic artery okay um, there is another diagram which I will show you later in the in the slides and I hope that uh, the concept will become clear more clear to you okay so um, this is the hepatic artery this is your hepatic vein okay or portal vein and this is the the green part is the bile duct which is carrying uh, basically bile is being produced in the liver and then through the bile duct it moves from the liver towards the gallbladder where it is where it is stored okay and when the digestion starts taking place this bile is released from the gallbladder and then it enters into the intestine okay and this basically helps this bile helps in the uh, emulsification of fats okay so uh, there are hepatocytes present here certain hepa hepatocytes are present okay so what is the structure of liver lobule I have just discussed this that uh, there is central vein present in the center then there are certain cellular plates okay then we have portal venules or portal veins uh, portal venules basically receive their blood from the portal vein okay then we have hepatic arterioles which supply the arterial blood to the septal tissues and we have hepatic sinusoids I've just discussed the sinusoids are basically low pressure vessels okay so venous sinusoids are lined by in this diagram you can see that this is the sinusoid okay this sinusoid is being surrounded by these Kupfer cells these are the Kupfer cells present then there are certain endothelial cells surrounding the sinusoids just peripheral to the sinusoid there are there is a space of dis present okay this space of dis is also called as peri sinusoidal space because peri means near or peripheral so it is present since it is present just peripheral to the sinusoid it is also called as peri sinusoidal space okay and what is the function of this space of this this space of this it allows the protein and other components from the sinusoids to be absorbed by the hepatocytes here the hepatocytes are present just below the space of this okay these are the hepatocytes then you can appreciate that this is the portal vein okay I'm marking it with the pen this is the portal vein and this is the hepatic arteriole at the end or terminal part of this portal vein and hepatic arteriole we have sinusoids present okay I hope this is clear now again this is another uh, view of the same diagram we have already discussed so hepatic vascular and lymph system 
blood flows through the liver from the portal vein and the hepatic artery the liver has a very high blood flow and low vascular resistance normally what happens is that the liver has a high blood flow rate and there is less vascular resistance as compared to other organs of the body okay but there is a certain disease which is called as cirrhosis of the liver and what happens in cirrhosis that fibrosis occurs of the parenchyma tissue what is parenchyma parenchyma is the functional tissue of the liver okay but in cases of cirrhosis which can occur due to uh, alcohol uh, increase alcohol consumption or it can occur due to um, certain other diseases cancer okay uh, so what happens is that due to uh, due to cirrhosis this uh, parenchyma of the liver is being replaced by fibrous tissue and fibrous tissue contracts around the blood vessels and it impedes or obstructs the blood flow thus increasing the vascular resistance in liver okay uh, i've just mentioned that the causes can be uh, hepatitis it could be alcoholism or it could be ingestion of certain poisons like carbon tetrachloride okay so liver functions as a blood reservoir as well liver is basically a large expandable venous organ which is capable of acting as a blood reservoir as well okay it supplies extra blood in times of diminished blood volume normally uh, the blood volume in the liver is 450 ml only but maximum blood volume can reach up to 0.5 to 1 liters okay so liver has a very high lymph flow i have already discussed this uh, that basically uh, hepatic sinusoids they are very permeable and passage of fluid takes place into the spaces of this okay uh, next we will move towards ascites what is ascites okay whenever there is high hepatic vascular pressure it can cause the fluid to move or leak out of the liver capillaries okay um when the fluid move out of the liver blood vessels then this fluid is getting accumulated into the abdominal cavity this is called as ascites okay ascites can occur due to certain infections uh it can occur due to cancer uh due to um, increase alcohol consumption okay so uh what are kupffer cells they are large phagos uh, they are large phagocytic macrophages that line the hepatic venous sinus i have already shown this uh, these type of cells in the uh, previous diagram the main function of kupffer cells is they cleanse the blood as it passes through the sinus and less than 1% of the bacteria enters the portal blood after passing through these kupffer cells so what are the metabolic functions of liver first is the carbohydrate metabolism okay liver stores large amounts of glycogen in it liver can also convert galactose and fructose to glucose okay and gluconeogenesis can also occur in liver remember that gluconeogenesis is the formation of glucose from non carbohydrate sources uh, it can be lactate it can be pyruvate okay it can be amino acids the conversion of fructose and galactose to glucose cannot be termed as gluconeogenesis you have to remember this okay also the formation of many chemical compounds from the intermediate products of carbohydrate metabolism occurs in liver so i am going to repeat that in liver storage of glycogen occurs conversion of galactose and fructose occurs to into glucose gluconeogenesis occurs from non carbohydrate sources and formation of certain chemical compounds also occur here so fat metabolism fat metabolism also takes place in liver it causes the oxidation of fatty acids to supply energy for body functions it can also synthesize large quantities of cholesterol phospholipids and most of the lipoproteins it can cause the synthesis of fat from protein and carbohydrate sources as well then protein metabolism can also take place in liver 
it can cause the deamination of amino acid deamination means the removal of amino group from any molecule okay it can also cause the formation of urea for the removal of ammonia ammonia is more toxic students as compared to urea so liver converts ammonia into urea okay formation of all the plasma proteins occur in liver except for gamma globulins okay and interconversion of various amino acids can also occur in liver other metabolic functions of liver is that it can store it is basically a storage site for vitamins if you can recall we started that hepatic portal vein it takes the nutrients from the stomach and intestine towards the liver so whatever vitamins iron copper is being transferred from intestine towards the liver it gets stored there the liver stores iron and in the form of ferritin it can also form a large portion of the blood substances which are used in coagulation for example fibrinogen prothrombin and factor 7 liver removes or excretes drugs which we have already discussed it can uh, it excretes opioids certain uh, certain chemotherapy drugs as well and it can remove certain hormones and other substances okay so the most important uh, functions of liver we have just discussed in a uh, very compact form the first one was carbohydrate metabolism then we discussed the fat metabolism the protein metabolism and the storage of vitamins iron and the formation of coagulating factors i hope today's lecture is clear to all of you Uh, in our next lecture we will uh, continue with the topic of liver and hopefully our uh, git will be complete by then